I'm Liz Faubless, and this is Currents. A provocative new documentary looks at the problem of bullying. Plus, at a time when religion faces vocal opposition in the public square, an academy in Queens is firm in the Catholic faith. When I see the kids pray, they mean the words they're saying. They, they're not just saying them for, for the sake of saying them that, oh, Mr. Corso said, let's pray. And Mother Teresa's story through the eyes of a local playwright. My true happiness is just being a wrinkled old woman trying to do God's work. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Well, it's become a disturbingly familiar story. Young teens, the victim of bullying, who see no other alternative but to take their own life in order to escape their aggressors. Now, one of the more high profile cases right now is playing out just across the bridge in New Jersey. Jurors there are deliberating in the hate crime trial of former Rutgers University student Darum Ravi. Ravi is accused of viewing a few seconds of his roommate's encounter with another man in their dorm room and telling people about what he saw. His roommate, Tyler Clementi, jumped to his death from the George Washington Bridge days after the alleged spying in September 2010. Now, incidents like this one were the inspiration for a documentary by filmmaker Lee Hirsch called Bully, which chronicles the lives of kids struggling with bullies. I feel kind of nervous going to school because I like learning, but I have trouble with making friends. They punch me, strangle me, take things from me, sit on me. Give it to him hard! Now that's really tough to watch. Thing is, not too many teens may even see the film. The Motion Picture Association of America has assigned it an R rating, citing strong language. And now that means no one under the age of 17 will be admitted into the movie unless a parent or adult guardian accompanies them. Now some argue the rating keeps the very people who need to see the film, teenagers, in the dark. Eileen Dwyer is one of those people. Earlier I spoke with Eileen, executive director of the Program for the Development of Human Potential, the Substance Abuse Prevention Program for the Catholic schools and parishes in Brooklyn and Queens. The program also provides counseling and intervention for children and teens in crisis. Eileen, obviously this movie really needed to be made. Our teens are in a state of crisis. What did you think about the subject matter and the way the movie was made? Um, I think it's a subject matter that is extremely important for our students and our families, parents, to, uh, to get a handle on and understand. Uh, every other day we're reading in the paper that some child commits suicide, and uh, when they do some investigation, they find that the child has been bullied. So it is a very serious problem. It is not a new problem, but one that uh, continues to escalate. Um, the fact that they followed these students over a period of time uh, and that these, it is a documentary, uh, are real life stories. They're not just, you know, fictional, made for TV movies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's very, very important. And, and the trial going on in, in New Jersey at the moment, this, this brings it closer to home. Have you been following that? And what are your thoughts on that particular situation? On the trial the, of the uh, of Rutgers the, student? Yes, ma'am. Um, again, uh, I think that probably. Uh, started out as probably this young man who, who actually did the webcam, thought mm -hmm. this would be a funny thing to do, uh, but was not even thinking about the impact that this would have on that young man's life. The MPAA, which is the Motion Picture Academy, saying that they have a to do due diligence. They have to inform parents that this movie might not be appropriate for kids under 17. What do you say to this? Given that there are teens, 15 and 16, who can get a job, but they're going to be turned away at the door if they see this movie. Well, in general, I understand the, uh, the MPAA's need to uh, rate certain films to give uh, parents some, some guidance. However, I think as a parent, I think you need to use your own judgments also and look at the subject matter. Uh, I believe this was given an R rating by just uh, the small margin of one vote. Uh, and uh, to have it stay as an R rating requiring parental permission uh, to attend the film 
um, I think is a little over, overkill on this. I've been to the movies many times. Uh, they are R-rated movies, and the children are going in to see them without parental consent. Eileen, what do you think, from your vantage point, can be done? Do we compel MPAA to change the rating, if that's even possible, or maybe just educate more parents to accompany their teens to this very important movie? I think you can do both. Um, you can join the, the petition that the uh, young woman, Katie Butler, has started online. Uh, and you can, at the same time, uh, encourage parents to attend the movie with their children and use it as a teachable moment. However, to be honest, I really don't think there will be too many adolescent teenagers wanting to attend the film with their parents in a public theater. Eileen, you have a, a very, very important vantage point um, with regard to your position. And I need to ask you, what is the current state of bullying in our Catholic schools right now? The current state of bullying in our Catholic schools reflects the current state of bullying everywhere. Um, the, the things that the Catholic schools have an advantage over is the fact that they're also doing things called emotional literacy, where we're asking children to be able to name their feelings, talk about their feelings, and build a sense of empathy. Now, while funding is important, you know that that's a topic of conversation that has come up during our visits to Albany with legislatures, so on and so forth. Have we put other significant issues on the so-called back burner and not giving it the attention that it's due, especially the bullying right now? Well, I think in our diocese, uh, the superintendent of schools has made it a priority to have some education uh, given to the faculties, because before you start working in a school around the issue of, bullet of around bullying, you need to educate the faculty about what it is, what it isn't, uh, what kind of a school climate uh, needs to happen so that children will feel safe and not bullied. So our superintendent, Tom, Dr. Tom Chadzutko, has taken um, uh, an important role in this. And who can parents or kids contact if they fear that there is bullying, if they're being bullying, any bullying incident? What, what is the best way to contact someone to get help? Well, when we, are, when we go into the schools, our program, we have some people who are trained in the Olveus Bullying Prevention Program, which is a, an evidence-based program. One of the, um, the mantras of that program is that if you are bullied, you need to tell an adult. And then the adults need to respond. It can't just be pushed under the rug. It can't be said, well, you know, kids will be kids. Children need to feel safe, and they have that right to feel safe at school. All right. Eileen, thank you very much. Some very important advice. And we do thank you so much for being with us today. Okay. On this thank you. Subject. Okay. Bye now. Bye bye. And stay tuned. There's more currents ahead. Coming up, an academy in Queens instills a Catholic identity in its students. I think because Notre Dame Catholic Academy has a strong Catholic identity, it shows me that Catholic education is working. And it's a common thread that bonds us together and it, it, it makes it special. Welcome back. Well, it's a time in our country when religious freedom is under attack. Could not be more evident than the federal government's contraception mandate, which would force most religious institutions to pay for health coverage that violates their consciences. Now, during these tough times for people of faith, a school in Queens is emphasizing a Catholic identity with its students. Notre Dame Catholic Academy in Ridgewood is in the same location that was once home to Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal School. Notre Dame Academy serves both the parishes of Miraculous Medal and St. Aloysius, and it's our latest School of the Week. Identity is very important. It sets you apart from everyone else, and everybody wants to be unique. We're taught to be unique and be ourselves, and so identity makes us who we are. Here at Notre Dame Catholic Academy, our identity is rooted in our faith. It's a big part of what we do and our students live the faith. It's been ingrained in them throughout the years, all the Catholic education they've had, wonderful teachers they've had. The two parishes that serve the academy are long-standing parishes. They've been around a very long time. They do have a strong sense of who they are as Catholics. I think they take the study of their religion, the doctrine, very seriously. They want to know who they are and where they came from. It's important to them. 
we teach them to be disciples of Jesus. It's not a religion, period. It's religion in everything we do. It's God in everything we do. So, you know, we're doing math, but we're, you know, we're, we're talking about Jesus. A big part of Catholic identity is prayer. We pray as a school in the morning. We pray as a school in the afternoon. The older students pray before each class. And when I see the kids pray, they mean the words they're saying. They, they're not just saying them for, for the sake of saying them that, oh, Mr. Corso said, let's pray. We had taken seventh graders on retreat, and the retreat master had commented on how seriously they took their faith and how mature they were about it. They know who they are. We do drives for the hurricane, uh, breast cancer, any kind of you know, disaster that strikes, the children's first impulse is to, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna collect for them? You know, their religion teaches them to help others, so they do it. Whether it's altar serving, choir, helping out in religious ed, they wanna demonstrate what they believe. And I think that's wonderful. Unfortunately, you know, in our society, religion sort of takes second or third fiddle behind so many other things. Our culture teaches materialism, you know, everything is about how much you have and, you know, that makes you successful and it's not about looking out for the other person. But our kids don't feel that way. They're not afraid to show that they're Catholic. They help me grow in my faith. I, that sounds, that might sound corny, but they do. Because I see in them the future of the church. I think because Notre Dame Catholic Academy has a strong Catholic identity, it shows me that Catholic education is working. And it's a common thread that bonds us together and it, it, it makes it special. God has to come first in, in your life and, and that's you know, something we try to instill in them. And so when they're older, they have that foundation, they have that belief inside of them. So they're strong enough to face the outside world. The seed has been planted you know, and it is blooming. Now, hopefully, when they leave here, it'll continue, and they will make a difference in the world. I truly believe that. Stay tuned, there's more Currents Ahead. A measure that would have expanded access to late-term abortion in New York State is set aside. We'll have that story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Liz Faubles. Coming up later, the struggles of Mother Teresa as told by a local playwright. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. U.S. bishops are strongly unified and intensely focused on threats to religious freedom. In a statement, the Bishops' Conference Administrative Committee says it's concerned not only with protecting church institutions, but also the individual faithful and the common good. The bishops say they are looking forward to the publication of a statement by their ad hoc committee for religious liberty. The statement will include a history of religious liberty in the U.S. and current threats to those freedoms. Now, the bishops say the Health and Human Services contraception mandate demands their, quote, immediate attention. They call on all Catholics and people of faith to join them in prayer and penance for the complete protection of religious freedom. There's also concern for people in the Middle East. The Bishop's Administrative Committee urged a change of heart and mind for those sowing division and hatred. They call on leaders of the Middle East nations to show respect for the rights and dignity of all citizens. They say Catholics, Christians, and everyone of goodwill must become peacemakers. A measure in the New York State Legislature that would have expanded access to late-term abortions is tabled for now. New York One reports Senate Republicans have sidelined the measure in a procedural move. The proposal would allow full-term abortions and make way for non-doctors to perform those terminations. Governor Andrew Cuomo had previously pledged his support for the rule, while the state's bishops had been outspokenly against it. An open letter calling on moderate Muslims to, quote, quit Islam has been rejected by the New York Times. According to one of the ad sponsors, a Times spokesman says they chose not to run the ad out of consideration for the safety of U.S. troops in Afghanistan. The letter was based on a previous ad calling on moderate Catholics to quit the Catholic Church, an ad the Times did run. In a release, Catholic League President Bill Donahue says there needs to be a national discussion on why the elite media, that's a quote, extends privileges to some sectors of society and not others. 
Meanwhile, energy drink maker Red Bull has decided to drop an ad in South Africa that features a depiction of Jesus. The ad shows Jesus walking on water with an apostle saying he thinks Jesus had a Red Bull. In the ad, Jesus reveals that he is walking on stones under the water. He also slips and takes his own name in vain. Speaking for South Africa's bishops, Cardinal Wilfred Napier says Red Bull, quote, overstepped the mark. He said that people are more than consumers and faith-based symbols are more than marketers opportunities. South Africans bishops had initially called on Catholics to fast from Red Bull until Easter. And from Cuba, a group of dissidents has holed up in a Havana church and are demanding an audience with Pope Benedict. The group is shuttered in Havana's Church of Charity of Cobre. The, prote the protesters are in an area of the church that is off limits to worshipers. Now, other dissidents and a church spokesman have denounced the move. The protesters say they want to bring attention to human rights abuses in Cuba. Pope Benedict will arrive on the island on March 26 after first visiting Mexico. Net and the tablet will have extensive coverage of that trip. Well, a priest in the Washington Archdiocese who, with, who withheld communion from a homosexual woman telling his side of the story. The incident took place at the funeral mass for the woman's mother. Father Marcel Guarnizio says the woman introduced another woman as her lover only minutes before mass began. The priest says he was prevented from speaking with the woman about the matter. Well, when she came to receive the Eucharist, he quietly withheld it in such a way that no one else in the church was aware of it. Father Garciano also says that he has not been suspended, but rather that his faculties to minister to the Washington Archdiocese have been removed. The priest says the Archdiocese acted based on two conversations related to the Eucharist incident. The Archbishop of Dublin says there is a real sense of renewal in the Irish Church leading up to the International Eucharistic Congress. Archbishop Diarmin Martin says the event will be a movement of healing for the church in Ireland. The church there has gone through some tough times since the 2009 release of a report detailing widespread abuse at church institutions going back decades. The International Eucharistic Congress will take place in June in Ireland. Brooklyn Auxiliary Bishop Frank Caggiano will be among the speakers at the 8-day event. Well, we've got driver license, driver's licenses and social security cards, but people in England and Wales will soon have cards identifying themselves as baptized Catholics. The Bishops' Conference of England and Wales is distributing a million of the cards to parishes across 24 dioceses. They are the size of a credit card, with one side listing six things Catholics must do, including celebrating the sacraments regularly and, quote, forgive as I have been forgiven. The other side of the card includes a quote from Blessed John Henry Newman. Well, we've all heard of custom-made clothing, but Pope Benedict has his own fragrance. According to the UK newspaper, The Guardian, the cologne mixes lime tree, grass, and other ingredients. The scent was created by an Italian perfume maker and is based on Pope Benedict's love of nature. Well, stay tuned. There's more currents ahead. When we return, personal experience inspires a local playwright to tell Mother Teresa's story. The inspiration basically was my daughter. She was thinking about becoming a nun, and I wanted to just find a role model for her to show that when you go into an order or you become a nun, you can really make a huge difference. Mother Teresa, Nobel Prize winner, founder of the Missionaries of Charity, beatified by Pope John Paul II. By all accounts, this beloved peacemaker was the personification of unwavering faith and service to God. But how many of us are aware that behind the acts of selfless kindness and charity, this saint-like woman was after all human and sometimes doubted her own purpose? As author and playwright Vincent D'Onofrio sees it, this doubt was not an insurmountable challenge. Instead, it was the inspiration that fueled Mother Teresa's great desire to make a profound difference in this world. We took a look at D'Onofrio's one-act play, Mother Teresa, Defense of Doubt, to understand what inspired him to write the piece. You think an old nun like me still has something of interest to say? I'm sure you do. Today we're going to see a one-act play called Mother Teresa, Defense of Doubt. I find the whole story uh, so revelatory of, of Mother Teresa as a human being. I think that, you know, we get caught up in the fact that she's so saintly that we forget that she's a human being. I'm standing on the edge of a great empty space. I fear falling in, and I am wondering 
if his presence is helping those who help the downtrodden, how is it that I experience no comfort in my work? It's a defense of doubt because most people say, oh, I see, you doubt this. That means it doesn't exist and you're having trouble. Mother Teresa took the doubts she had and she turned it around as an engine to push her life forward. That's what that little piece in the play is, you know. Oh, the doubt seems to push you forward. It's like he's not there. Dear girl, God's presence is not found in Hollywood drama and lights. His presence is found in the people that no one wants, the lepers, the abandoned. The inspiration basically was my daughter. She was thinking about becoming a nun, and I wanted to just find a role model for her to show that when you go into an order or you become a nun, you can really make a huge difference. He gave us a plan. Is it his fault we chose not to follow it? There have been times when I've regretted that question. Um, I play Jackie Soap. She is a college reporter from State University. She wants to kind of prove her wrong, you know? She's like, she's so cynical when it comes to all these things and she doesn't really believe it. So she kind of wants to hear Mother Teresa's, you know, reasons for why she believes that. And it's kind of like, she has doubts, like probably many normal people do, but like, why do all these bad things happen, you know, if there's a God? Or how do all of these things happen? My true happiness is just being a wrinkled old woman trying to do God's work. And are you? Happy or wrinkled? As an actress, I realize that I have to play Mother Teresa as a character. I have to approach it from a character point of view. I can only hope that the spirit of my words can convey who Mother Teresa was. Certainly I'm physically nothing like Mother Teresa and uh, the accent is very difficult, but I, I, work, I work at it. So I actually like the writing was very well crafted. I love the witty humor. You know, that's really something that really kept me interested about, you know, really interested about the play. I like that it touched upon very important subjects, how Mother Teresa coped with her own doubts and what she called emptiness. Many people will never get the opportunity to see Mother, they won't get the opportunity to see Mother Teresa in person. Mother Teresa has passed on. So the spirit of who she was as a woman, uh, this play has the ability to keep that spirit alive and in the flesh, so to speak. Um, and I think it's an important message for the world because Christ wants us to help the sick and the abandoned. Fill me with your presence. Forgive me and forgive all. And that is all for this edition of Currents. Coming up tomorrow, we'll get you ready for St. Patrick's Day. We'll take you to an Irish language mass and hear the real story of St. Patrick. Until then, be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Faubless. Thank you for watching and have a good night. Thank you.